So is everyone ready to answer this question on the exam? strategy in more detail and builder in more detail. I mean, other than that in the book, strategy only has one method, but I don't think that's a hard rule. If you didn't have the builder pattern, I think you would say, and you did the same thing, I think you would say you were using the strategy pattern. And another close one is you could also say you're using template method. But other than the purpose of it, I don't see any significant difference in the you know, deployment of it. It's almost like a specialization of strategy. Yeah, I didn't want to accept that, accept the comment about template method. What? The comment about template method. Go um, off the strategy and build a pattern. Um, in the invitation, in my view, is template method, but that's not necessarily. Right, so for example, um, in the Sachs Handler case, you know, there's an abstract class, you have subclass, and all the methods are basically do nothing, right? So you just have to implement the one that you want. Um, but there's no template method involved there. It's just here are the you know, end things that the director will ask you to do, right? And there also is independent age for the Well in that in that example the template method would be the director. And then it's going through and it's doing its thing, and then it, the the template, I mean it's not it's not a perfect fit, but it's still it's the same kind of thing where the director's doing what it does and then somebody else overrides the methods to get the behavior that they want. Yes, but the overriding methods in a different class, right? The template method is totally different than that. The template method says, look, if the parent is going to implement a method, and it's going inside this method is going to call other methods, right? And the child then does not override that. The main method overrides some of the pieces of that method that is useful. So the template method is always a base class. I mean, it's always a drive class. Right. Okay. Yeah. Break from the gang of four patterns, right? Dependency injection is maybe a very big. Um, now, so the article that Father wrote, use um, example of this movie finder, right? Um, and so you want, you know. Do things like you know find all movies by a certain director or maybe a certain actor, um, and movie data is in this convoluted file. Colon the file, um, and so then you know there's a class that's going to read the file and store information in some sort of data structure we can search. Um, and then he has this class called movie lister, and then what we do is, right, an instance of our colon limited prop movie finder, and it then reads a file and stores in some sort of structure, you know, table like structure, and you know then. Finding the movies by a certain director, you know, so we grab all the movies out of the 
finder and then just one that the director is equal to what we're looking for and then we can return that list, right? <coughs> And it says, yeah, you know, this is if we're writing software just for one person to use, right, himself, like, okay, it's going to be fine. But the problem is, you know, what happens when we want other people want to use this and they, they may want to use a different data source for data, right? And the problem is now we've coupled, right, this movie lister to that file format by hard coding and the finder we use, right? So we want to decouple them. Um, you know, so what happens if you want to you know, move it to it? You know, if, if we're going to have all the movies ever produced, right? Having a them in a file may not be very efficient. Um, or put in a database. Um, and the dependencies inside the class, right? They're coupled together. Um, so it's right there. We've hard coded. And now to make the change, right? We're going to change it then and make the change inside. Right? And one thing we talked about early on was say, I've been running programming is supposed to make it easy for us to modify our code, and all of a sudden we have to edit that class every time we want to do something different. It's like, oh, that's not that's not going to work, right? It's not going. It's not. <coughs> it's not easy to modify, right? If we have to do that, right? And the problem is, right? We start building up. You have a low level, okay, reading the file, and then parsing the file in, into the data structure, right? And the low level, and the problem is we start building dependencies on higher level depends on those things, right? And how do we decouple the higher level logic from the lower level type, type of operations, right? In this case, how do we decouple our movie lister from that particular file format, right? <clears throat> right? So we have these low-level things, and we build up higher-level structures, and all of a sudden, right, the higher-level movie lister is t tied to that low-level thing. And how do we deal? How do we make that more flexible? Right, so our, we can, you know, one, we can program to an interface, right? Um, and have some sort of interface for this movie finder, and then um, we can have different implementations of it, and then if we change our mind, if we change to a database or a different type of file implementation, um, as long as the lister only program is going to use that interface, it's going to be easier to change, right? And more flexible. But how do we then, how does the movie lister get that dependency, right? Um, You know, we could create a factory method, right? But then, if you want to change, well, we have to create a subclass, right? And that subclass can override that factory method and return something different, but it still requires us to create a subclass, right? It's not as bad as having to edit the, the class itself, but we still have to create a subclass to actually um, use a different type of finder. Right. 
So for each new concrete implementation of the movie finder, you create that subclass, and then you create that finder, and then you the subclass, right, our movie lister to create that new factory method. Or we could just, you know, do something simple like, okay, have a constructor, right? And pass in that particular finder, right? It's sort of like, you get to write articles and just say, oh, just use a constructor, right? But all of a sudden, now, if you want a different type of movie finder, what do we have to do, right? For each concrete movie finder class, we have to create the class, and then when we instantiate movie lister, we just pass in that particular. So far, so good. You have this one little problem, right? There's still some place we have to, you know, create the movie lister, and that place we still have to say new database finder, right, or colon, right? So we still have to edit that place, right? So we've, we've pushed the problem out of the movie lister class. The movie lister class now is flexible and can deal with things, right? But there's still some spot, right? It's definitely better because we don't have to edit the, the movie lister class or create subclasses. We just say, here's your finder. But we still have some place where we say new movie finder and then pass it into right, the movie lister. Right. And so then, yeah, we do something like this, right? So we're manually injecting into the movie lister its dependency, right? It depends upon a movie finder, and so we're going to we're going to inject into add it to the movie lister. We're doing it manually. And so every time we change what type of movie finder we want, we have to edit that file. So this is kind of a one file for the whole application where the instance are being created. Yeah, so it... Kind of, so you're saying give me this inject these objects into these files, right. one place for full, full application. Yeah, we'd like that, right? Um, right, so we went from new, right, to do this to that. And every time we change what the finder is, this line has to be changed. Yeah. We'll pass fast that way. If you have to change it, if you're in a language that has to recompile a bunch of stuff, you know, if all you have to recompile is your main, that's that's good. That's definitely good, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> but again, this example is is very simplistic, right? So. It, it's not going to be in our main, right? In general, this this will not be in the main, right? It's going to be embedded in various spots. And we have a, a reasonably sized program, right? This is not going to be in the main. It's going to be somewhere else, and there could be 10, 20 of them scattered on the code base, right?
And so if you get 10 or 20 of them, like we just said, it's like, like one spot where we say, oh, here's... Now one thing we do is we can have an abstract factory, right? And then we just specify the factory in one place, and then whenever we want to inject something in, right, we call the factory to inject X, inject, you know, give me the X, give me the Y. So then, again, we reduce it down to, you know, one spot, right? So you start to see how we can you use that pattern to make it our code more flexible, and we have fewer places we have to modify places, right? You know, instantiate this abstract factory, and now all those twenty places where you inject things, and in, you just say, you know, give me, give me the movie lister finder, give me this, right? And I'll inject it into the. And once you go to that step, then there's one more step that's obvious. Um, yeah, manjection is hard, right? Like I said, we can. The aspect factor will help a lot here, right? Um, A slight detour. Um, has anyone used programs that have plugins? Anyone use the, ever use Eclipse? And how does Eclipse work? <laughs> when you want to add more languages to Eclipse, what do you do? You download a plugin for the language, right? IntelliJ, people use IntelliJ. And again, you can add functionality to IntelliJ by downloading plugins, right? So we're actually adding functionality to an existing program without recompiling the program, right? So we're not modifying code in the program. We're not going into main and changing, you know, colon movie finder to database movie finder, right? So I have just downloaded a game, and I'm sure plenty of people have done this, and downloaded mods for it, and then configured those mods without obviously modifying the code of the game. That's kind of the same thing. Yeah. The mods are plugins. Right, so the, we can actually add classes to an existing program, right? Basically, on you start the program up. Right. All right. So if you. Your application has some sort of plugin repository, right? And there's an interface that the plugins are written to, right? And so the your program is going to look in that directory and look at all the plugins, and it's going to load them one at a time. And so we're actually m modifying the functionality of your program without changing the program at all. Right, so we define an interface, right, that the plugins have to match, right? And 
your program needs an access in that interface because it's okay. Um, it then uses that interface instead of the actual, when you're declaring types, right? And when you're returning func function returning values, right? Um, so it just knows what that interface. Right, and now at runtime, you read your plugin directory and you read this and you, right, you read it in as, as an instance of that interface and so now your program can interact with it. Right, and then we can create this factory. So we need a particular service. We can then call in the factory, give me that instance of that service. All right, different plugins affect the game differently, right? They, do, they provide different functionality. Um, so there might be different types of interfaces for different types of things you can do. then the, the code, it's not just picking between a set of implementations that it, I mean, it, it's never, you're given it a DLL that it's never seen before, and it's somehow loading that and attaching it to an interface. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the whole trick, right? Well, um, if we could if we do a Java, right? Um, Java always loads its classes of runtime, right? And it, it loads them on demand. <coughs> And so, if you think of Java, then what we could do is, if you know the, the name of a class, you can then ask the class loader to load it for you. Right? So, in this, the structure, so you scan, right, you plug in directory, and you get the concrete class of all those elements in the plug in directory. And then to load it, you just basically ask the class loader, here's a class I want, and you make sure the plugin directory is in your class path and drop it. And you get an instance of it, it's an object of that class. And then in our outside factory, right, we can have different, we can basically have a list of all the services we can possibly add to our program, and then for each service we get well, this service is attached to this class, this service knows about this class, right? Um, now we're back to our outside factory again. So instead of having to hard code which factory we use, right, at runtime we can read our plugin directory and find there's probably some structure that tells us, okay, this plugin has this class and, right, it, it, well, it fits this service, this interface. So, the main program would be having a lot of interfaces, not a single one, and each plugin would say, this is the interface I'm going to implement, which gives the implementation of right. a particular interface. Yeah. That's the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, if I install one plugin and then install the second plugin on top of it, it's gonna mask the previous one. Because two plugins don't know about each other, right? I mean, there's a... Yeah, so now we need more information, right? Um, for example, we may have a plugin to do syntax highlighting of a language, right? Mm -hmm. And then your editor may you may want to do Java and JavaScript, right, and different languages. So each each one of those plugins is going to do satisfy the you know syntax highlighting interface. So now now we need more information. To say oh, syntax highlighting for language X, right? So then we can load in 10 plugins with syntax highlighting. Now, then the issue becomes what happens when you have two different plugins that do syntax highlighting for Java. And then you have to decide 
you know, how do we deal with that situation? Yeah, and, and games a lot of time, that's why the order of your mods is important. Because they'll call all of them and with the same interface, they'll right. just do them in a certain order. And if you get the order messed up, then it won't work right. Does it always do the last one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, if you have two of them, we do the same thing, the first one is ignored, right? Or it's read in and then overwritten by the second one. It'll just, it'll just call the, the, there's multiple interfaces, it'll just call them in the order. Right. And then, I mean, certain ones might not do anything for that particular interface, but, um, but it'll go through and ask them all what they want to do. So yeah, there, there are a number of details you have to you do, right? Um, and mm -hmm. determine what those interfaces are, it takes some work, right? In the games, right? I mean, you design the game to think, you know, what interface should it be, right? That people are going to program to to be effective. Yeah, it's it's very effective too because the game producers that do it right end up with a massive community of uh, modders that right. just add a bunch of value to their game for free, yeah. and so they can have a mediocre game, but. By the time someone wants all the mods and downloads all the mods, then they have a great game. Yeah. Even they even get their bugs fixed, you know. That's a good model. Yeah, it's a good example. Of what we'll, we'll talk about later the open close principle, right? Your program, your your program is actually fixed, but you can now modify it without having to do anything to your program. Right, so yeah, you basically, like I said, you can read all, all the plugins and instantiate them and you know, create an affect factory so that you can, for a particular service, you can request, you know, give me that, and you have to do it, you know, per language or, per, you know, various levels of, depending upon what your context is. What does that last line mean? Plugin source code does not have reference class of the service. Which service is talking? Yeah, the plugin, um, the source code doesn't does not know what doesn't have access to your the program source, right? At all. Um, they just know about the interface. They know the right. interface, right. Right. The gamers are not going to, game companies aren't going to give up the source code to the game, right? The modders, no. Oh, mm. That's, that's their, that's their intellectual property, right? That's what they're making money off of. Just here's the API you use, right? Yeah, sometimes they don't even really give that out. People just figure it out. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes the, the mod system is designed by the uh, game company for their own <coughs> content. Right, right, yeah. And then other people crack it and, and figure out how to make their own mods. <coughs> so it's, you know, it's a it's a very useful pattern, right? Be able to create a structure of the program and then you be able to modify it with, with these plugins. So is is this the same pattern basically underlying the little com stuff? Um, I don't know if you work with that, it was kind of a pain in the butt. I mean, it's still used today, but the Windows com component object model where you can kind of load things and load their interfaces and query for interfaces. Yeah, I don't know much about it. it. It probably is, right? I mean, the same sort of idea where they create the structure, then you 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 add the different modules or DLs yeah. of it. Yeah.
right? I mean, yeah, I mean, in Java, you can just class for name, right? And, and well, then basically Java will go look in the class path for a class for that name, and it's just it'll load it for you. You're done. You give it, and then once you got the class loaded, you can create an instance of it. That's it. I mean, Right now, back to dependency injection. Now, once we know about this plugin pattern, we can do the obvious, right? Have a spot where we read in the dependencies and maybe even the actual classes that we want to use. Like all those frameworks start spring.xml, I mean they have the single xml file where we define all the yeah. dependencies. They just load up at the starting of the server and then once have, I mean, then you do not need to say anywhere new. Yeah, exactly, and that's exactly where we're headed. It's like, it's in spring, right? You have this you have a configuration file in XML. Application context.xml file which have all the context of that. Right. Here's all the dependencies, here's all the things they want, right? And then you read the file, and we then inject the dependencies where they belong in the program, and we're, we're done, right? And then you have more control, you can define whether you need a singleton class, sure. right. or you yeah. can, uh, there are AOP you can put on top of it. So you have one place where you can do a lot of stuff on top of it. Yeah, I mean, so there's, yeah, this, this file which specifies the details you want, and by modifying that file, when you start the program up, it's going to read that file, and then it's going to inject the dependencies based upon that. Now, so I talk about three different types of inject injection. One is constructor, um, is obvious you have a constructor, right? And, um, you do, you know, want to be able to inject. So then the, we want, instead of manually injecting things, we want to sort of have this file someplace where we read the file, right, and we then um, inject into it. Um, and now with this Pico container thing, it's source code, but what we're doing now is we're going to specify our dependencies, and that's it. And then, um, you know, we're basically saying, okay, movie finder class, you know, it's going to depend upon the call movie finder class. And then the pick container is going to then, it's going to instantiate the movie this finder class for us, and it knows that, okay, when it does so, it has to use the movie finder class for the constructor, um, and then we can give it parameters that get injected into it, right? So now what we do is, you know, we create these classes, and then we independently create the, the Pico container class to tell us how things are all connected together. Because you know, different systems have different ways of injection, right? Spring has their own system, XML files. You know, Pico container, you create source code to 
specify basically the same thing you do in spring, right? Instead of in, this here, it's like well, specifying well, move finder class needs, right? The colon finder class. And here are the parameters that it needs. And so every program wants a new movie lister, <coughs> right? We're going to have the, the container is going to create it for us. Um, Right, so we basically um, you know, ask for a mobile lister class and we get it that we get it configured for us based on our configuration source code as both configuration file. You know the exact <coughs> details of this system are not important. What's important is oh, we have a way of specifying here are, here are my dependencies. Movie class, movie finder class depends upon this particular finder, and here are the arguments. Right? In Spring, you do it with a file. Here we do it with a source code. And so now we're pushing out our dependencies out of our program into a separate entity. Right? And that allows us to, you know, modify how our program works to a certain degree without modifying the program itself. So, is this right to say that dependency injection is the implementation of factory pattern? That's a wrong statement. Um, no, I would not say that. I wouldn't say that dependency injection is an instance of the factory pattern. Uh, you may use the factory pattern to implement your dependency injection system, um, but that there may be other ways of doing it. It's occurring to me that Calm, with all of its complexities, is kind of a way to do this kind of a thing without reflection. Because, you know, yeah. reflection is a very powerful thing for the language to have it. I don't think C++ still, I don't think they have reflection. Probably not, no. But you get pointers, so you're going to do whatever you want. <laughs> right, I mean? Yeah, but the running code has no idea what it's going to Right, then we basically, um, you know, we, we call a particular container and then we can, you know, give me an instance of a particular class, right? And it's then going to use that dependency information we gave it to actually, you know, instantiate the right type of movie finder and then put it in the constructor of the movie list. <laughs> Um. So, yeah, right, I mean, This illustrates, you know, important fact, important, important thing is like, okay, doing it directly is, is usually simpler and easier to understand, right? Just, it's three lines, I'm done. <coughs> right? But now we want this flexibility, it comes at a cost, right? We now need this injecting system, right? And so we need to have code that does that, and we then have to configure it, right? So here's my configuration, and then I have to have this indirection. I can't create the class directly because to do that, I have to go back up to the top part. And so I, you know, ask the injection system, give me an instance of that class. 
right? So usually in engineering there's always trade-offs. We gain something, but we lose something. Also, I can say that in the system, it should only have one class loader for such things. Because if it has two class loaders, you cannot create two different things that might give you and give you back. The same problem which we discussed in the singleton thing. Right, yeah, you need one class loader, right. Well, so now we can, you know, we can use this trick to put our, you know, load our, even in the PO container case, into the source code, we can still load it, right? So we could have different configuration files, even though they're not, they are source code, but we can compile it and read that. It's still a file, right? Then there's setter injection, where basically you have a setter method, right, where you pass in the dependency. And so in Spring, right, we get these XML files. Um, you know, and then you do something again, again, but. It's the same idea, right? Um, so now you have to read that spring file, right? And then there's some code they wrote for you that will read it and then right, returns, you know, this application context thing and now we can use that to query, you know, give me the you know, give me that object from that class. An interface injection gives us an interface, right? Um, that allows you to specify whatever method you want to inject the dependency. So what we what we are saying over here, we are not injecting injecting the instance or no we're still injecting an instance but um, how do we how do we inject it right well the first time was it was a constructor second time was the setter now it's just like I, I define what method <coughs> I want to use to inject it into the instance in that interface so you would use this if you wanted to change what the dependency was at one time instead of that construction time, you might want to, because it seems like for a setter or for this, you it's easier to do that construction time unless it's going to change during the runtime of the program. Yeah, the setter of this allows you to do it at different times, right? Mm -hmm. Where the constructor is only once. Mm -hmm. so what is the use case when we need to use the setter one? And then this one, what's the advantage of using this one on, instead of a uh, setter? Well, let's, let's first talk about what's, what's the advantage of using a setter over the constructor, right? That is runtime. I mean, if we want to change the behavior over the runtime, then we're going to use the setter. And if we want everything, we know the behavior, then we go for the constructor time. Well, there's also, um, here we're only injecting one dependency, right? What if there are five or six dependencies you want to inject? Um, you know, then we might want to use a setter just just so we make it easy on ourselves. Because otherwise, you have this constructor of five things or six things. It gets to be awkward, right? So we might want to use setters just 
when there's more to, more than one or two dependencies, right? Now between this and the setter, um, And this becomes more general because now your framework is an injection it doesn't have to worry about your particular class at all. It only has to worry about that interface. Right, if we go back to the center, right? Um, Somehow our, our system to do the injection has to know about that you know, set finder method. Yeah, because constructors are always a concrete class. This would always be some sort of class hierarchy, whereas the interface can be shared by anything. Another way to do this um, is with be a service. Um, so you've got some system running someplace where you can then contact and say, you know, give me, you know, what dependencies I use for, you know, what do I use to find movies? Right, so I can ask the service to provide that for me. And usually that, re that requires now to have a separate separate machine running a service, right? And you can figure and then your clients will contact and say, can we, you know, tell me what movie finder to use. But then we basically push the, the question off to how do you configure the, the service to know what finder to use, right? The same issue. It's just that now we can have a central spot where multiple machines can then use it, that, that configuration, rather than having to pass it off to everyone individually. So the service locator is a singleton usually, and it, it seems like this is like a different model, like fish versus full, where the injection, you're pushing the, the objects that you want into the objects, right. whereas with this, the it's objects themselves would pull know how to contact the service locator and pull it. Yeah, yeah okay. right, yeah. It's kind of a reverse model. Yeah. Difference right well if you if you have a server locator and the service goes down, your clients are stuck, right? Network goes down, you're stuck. Service locator somewhere else. Can't we have like a service locator layer inside the same application, which is just for decoupling the client, and but having on the same one. But that's basically what Spring does already, right? 
inside your application is a separate component that knows how to in, what to inject. Well, as he said, push and pull. I mean, if we want the pull mechanism and we wanted to implement service locator on the same. So is it right to say whenever we have a service locator, it has to be somewhere outside? Yeah, usually it's a, when you talk about service locator, we're talking about a separate program running we contact. Uh, so is Gradle a service locator? So Gradle allows you to specify um, dependencies, um, right? And it downloads the dependencies from remote machines. Um, so it's not really a service locator. It's basically A dependency system that knows how to fetch remote dependencies, right? So you're still configuring your basically IDE on what components you need to compile this program. So the configuration is still local, it's just that the dependencies are not on your machine in a plugin directory, they're elsewhere. Yeah, it's not not a service locator, no. So if you just spend all your life writing applications, right, to realize that you know we can have our program use plugins, right? Is it, Changes your perspective somewhat. Now, somewhat related, um, all the solid principles. You know the game. You want to. You want. You want to create an acronym that means something, and so you have to figure out how to fit the acronym into meaning words. And so, it's the yeah, answer: single responsibility principle, all is open calls principle, list up, and then interface situation principle, and then dependency inversion principle. Right. Um, And again, this is a, he calls himself Uncle Bob, but it's Robert Martin, um, was a, early in his career, he, he wrote a lot of C++ books and was um, a fairly well-known C++ person. Um, And so, yeah, he, he, he describes, you know, usually when, there's, when you read old textbooks, they talk about a class that represents a single abstraction and do one thing, right? Um, his, his is slightly different, like, a class don't have one reason to change, right? And he says, yeah, it's the simplest idea, but it's really hard to get. What, what, what do you mean by one reason to change? You know, so the example he gives, right, he talked about the modem interface. Um, and so, and he gets this interface where there's dial and hang up and send and receive. Um, of course, it, it, it shows you um, 
with age, right? Having modems that dial up. Right. If we have to change the interface on one of those methods, then every place the program has to be recompiled, right? All the classes that use the interface have to be redone. And if there's not going to be any changes in the future, then who cares? Right? But it says there's two, two different types of responsibilities there. One is making a connection, and the other one is, is sending data, right? So we combine two different types of things, two different reasons we want to change, right? Um, connection management, we no longer do dial up, right? Um, so that has to change. You know, so if we had a, if we had a, a program using this interface, you know, from the old days, right? At some point, like dial-up goes away. I mean, and so we'd have to change that part. But now, if we keep that interface in one, like it is, we're going to have to change every look at worry about every part of the program that uses it, even ones that just do data communication, right? Yeah, this is a hard part. Like, but how do you know what what's going to change, right? Um, so yeah, we should, you know, break that into two interfaces: one for the data communication, and one for making the connection. Now when you, when you go from the old style to, right, now it's all IP based, and so we'd change just how to make the connection. And only the parts of the program that dealt with the interface would need to change. Whereas, came together, we have to change both. It's like, I mean, so if we see this one that we just learned the plugin thing. Right. So in plugin also, they should be having a lot of interfaces for each and everything, like coloring of the syntax, and then maybe finding the errors or giving suggestion. So need to be come up with so many interfaces so that every plugin. Every functionality needs to be encapsulated into a single interface. Kind of. Yeah, and that's where engineering comes in, right? Every every decision we make has a trade-off. Um, for the plugin situation, we have to figure out what types of services do we want the plugins to provide? Syntax editing, and what does that entail, right? And somehow we have to give the plugin access to um, source code and give it ways of telling, you know, the editor, how, you know, how to highlight things, and make things bold, or change colors, right? 
in the gaming situation, right, I mean, same thing, right, there, you have to specify what types of things do you want the plugins to be able to do, right, and, if, and there are different types of plugins and different things. Well, usually with, with games, the way they work is that they, the plugins, I mean, it's kind of a bad design in a sense, because the plugins usually just have access to the whole game engine and can just do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite as you know organized as you want in a serious application where you want you know this plugin to implement this interface and not to have just broad um, broad access to everything in your system. But so what he was saying, I mean, you could you could have an object that implemented yeah. multiple interfaces. You could still load it and not use them all. You could right. say, I want this this object with this interface as long as the object allowed you to do that. And if it blindly followed this principle like solid, then there would be a lot of interfaces. I mean, there's always a trade-off. Yeah, but the, the key phrase you said blindly, right? Mm -hmm. um, you should never blindly follow any. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I mean, you laugh, right? But, you know, for example, we always tell students, globals are bad, right? And so they, you know, but there are times when you need globals. And so it's, it's again, the trade-off, right? Globals have, you know, certain benefits and certain drawbacks. And the question is when are the benefits outweigh the, the drawbacks? In different situations, the answer is going to be different. Right now, the plugins, right, in some sense are, right, they're adding the functionality instead of changing the main program. Right, we're not we're not changing. We can add functionality that happened. So it's closed in the sense that we're not modifying. Right, our game engine has not been modified. Right, that's fixed. It's closed. But it's open for extension. But we can't change everything, right? Everything's not. And like I said, in pen injection, right? I showed you. You start with three lines, and you got this. Right. The more flexible we make it, right, the more complicated things get. Um, so the question is, you know, what things do we close off? What things do we should we leave open for extended? Extend so, again, if we see a case, there's a class which is. Uh, like a C class, if it's a working fine for a long time. Right. Now we need to add a functionality. There are two ways. Either we extend the class, modify the extended class, or the composition. Make a different class and then point to that one. So we know composition is better than inheritance. If we try to do composition, we are some way change the class. I mean, even for two lines, but we are changing the main, uh, the existing class to inject the composition. Well, first of all, you probably should have used like the adapter pattern, right? Or, I mean, say adapter, right? That's the common thing to do, is right? Is we need to <coughs> modify that so we use an adapter or my right, decorator. And if the, if the class is that old, um, you probably don't want to touch it directly because no one really understands it anymore. Even if you don't consider it's an old class, 
it's an existing yeah. class which is not very old but right. then also if we go with the principle we need to go with extending the class instead of going for a composition that kind of two theories yeah. contradict each other that's what i'm trying to say um yeah i mean definitely yeah, the open close principle was first proposed by uh, Bertrand Mayer, um, and his answer was, yeah, you subclass the class, right? So we could, the main class is closed, right? But then it's still open for extension between great subclass. Um, so that's one way of, of extending the closed class, right? Now, like you said, we now can use composition. We can basically wrap in something um, to do some modification to it. Although it becomes harder, um, we can add things to it, but it's harder to change what the actual class does itself, right? We can, the wrapper class can get a request, to get modify the request, to could do some extra stuff, we call the old class, get the response back, and modifications but it's not going to change what the imp output's going to be from that old class or subclassing can right we, we can use template method to modify the behavior of the parent class without modifying the parent class so it depends on what type of change you want right can we Plus, if you use a wrapper class, oh, can you now, can you replace the original object with this new object? Because they have to have the same types, right? And if you didn't create an interface, right, or an abstract class for that situation, then you can have to, mod with subclassing, you just subclass and then we're ready to go. So again, it's always case to case. You have to look at the context and figure out which one fits better. Which one? For those of you who know, Liskov is actually Barbara Liskov. So she's a female, um, famous um, computer science. Uh, person um, at MIT. Um, she won numerous awards for her work. Um, and the principle, again, is quite simple, but it's subtle. Um, and so, a lot of OOPS books um, Use this sort of example, right? You've got a rectangle class, and I want a square class, and so you subclass it because you know square is a type of rectangle, right? Um, but the problem is, um, so here's my rectangle class, right? Width, I can get the width and height, I can set the width and height, and I can compute the area. Um, and then, of course. The square class to make that work, I mean, it has to be square, so if you if I subclass it, I mean, what do I do with width and height? Well, I have to do something like this. So I have to say, well, you set the width, well, I get the width and the height, because it has to be the same, right? Um, and then I can, you know, create a method to take a rectangle and set its width and height, and I can compute this area. Wait. That doesn't make sense, right? Right? And the problem is the behavior of a square is not the same as the behavior of a rectangle. Right? Thank <laughs> you. 
And again, in most OOPS texts, they talk about is a relationship, right? If A is a type of B, then A should be a subclass of B, right? And a rect, you know, a square is a type of a rectangle, so the square class should be, right? But according to this class, like, no, 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 no. This is a relationship pertains to the behavior. If the behavior, right, is the same, then yeah, now you make it a subclass. The behavior of a square is not the behavior of a rectangle. So we don't want the square to be a subclass of a rectangle. So I actually am not getting it. How the behavior is different? If I set the if I set in a rectangle, if I if I change the width, I don't change the height. Right? I can modify the one, one dimension without modifying the other dimension. But if we change the height, if it is scale, we're going to change the width also. That's what we wrote the function. For, for a square, right? Yeah. Right, I get this, right? And if I it's a rectangle, right? I can pass in okay. a square object, right? If I pass in a square object, I get that answer. If I pass in a rectangle, I get 10. Okay. I just notice that 4 really, that thing. Yeah, yeah, so it's, right? So basically, right, you're saying that you know subclass should be, you know, we should be able to substitute it, right? Um, but the, the, the child class behavior should be the same as the parent. Now, so next time we can start off with.